Welcome into Rounding the Bases. Uh, round the bases. Everybody knows Joe Goldberg. It's a round the bases. Everybody knows Joe Goldberg. He's the man, God dang it. Welcome back to another episode of Rounding the Bases presented by Community America Credit Union. I'm Joel Goldberg. I have got an episode I've actually been waiting to do for years for the timing to be right. It's right. Not that I had to wait, but I wanted to wait. The timing is right. I'll get into that in a moment. Shout out, as always, to my friends at Chief of Staff Kansas City. If you're listening to this in KC or around the country and you need a resource, you're looking for a job, you're looking to place someone, you're you're looking for whatever it is, uh, go to my friends at Chief of Staff Kansas City, chiefofstaffkc.com, making connections that matter. I want to get right to this. For Kansas City Royals fans, my guest today needs no introduction, and it's perfect as this comes out. It's opening week in baseball. He's a 13-year major leaguer, or I should say former major leaguer, an all-star game MVP, a world champion. For the non-baseball fans, because most of my guests are usually not ball players on rounding the bases, uh, or more often focused on business and leadership, uh, let me just read a very, very short excerpt from Chapter 5 of my book, Small Ball, Big Results, where I describe today's guest as, quote, the best leader I've covered in baseball, end quote. I guess that's not really reading. It's just a few words. But I wrote that in 2020, and it still stands true today. As I embark on my 17th season, I can't even believe that, as the host of every Royals pregame and postgame show and all the in-game interviews, I could say that I've met and interviewed hundreds upon hundreds of MLB players in my career, dating back before Kansas City. And I've met unbelievable people. I'm often asked, who's my favorite? It's an impossible question. I could list off superstars and role players, guys that were barely in the league for hours upon hours. But if pressed, it's a three-way tie between Alex Gordon, who's been on this podcast after he retired, Salvador Perez, who at some point will be, and I've tied to him forever with the Salvi splash, if you're familiar with that, and the man I'm about to bring on this show. A little personal perspective for you. The first player the Royals drafted in 2008, which was my first year in Kansas City, was an 18-year-old named Eric Hosmer. That's when I first met him with his family. He was 18. I was 36. He's now 34. And I'm not in my 30s or 40s anymore. But I do have an 18-year-old daughter, so that's crazy to think she's what he was age-wise back then. The man that was known as Papo by some of his teammates and by Haas from the rest of us is officially a retired Major League Baseball player, and he's come over to the dark side into some version of the media. I am joined right now by my friend and longtime big leaguer, Eric Haas, who's got his own studio at home now and all this. Haas, what's up? Joel, appreciate that intro, man. I was going to make fun of you for having your own book in the background, but... You gave talk me a good about, intro. Talk, I can't talk, do talk, that now. Come on. Who's in that? I, I I should probably just have a picture propped up of you. <laughs> <laughs> you said I was a good leader. I taught you humbleness. That's for sure, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you taught me to be confident. That, that's all. Somehow you, you always found a way to be confident in yourself and humble all at the same time. Let, let's, let's start with this. Um, since I saw you on an everyday basis, and I think the last time I saw you at Kauffman Stadium, out of nowhere, you were wearing a Red Sox jersey. It was supposed to be a Padres jersey. We'll get into all that later. But since all of that, you've retired. Before that, you got married. You became a father. You are now part of a, a massive podcast and media company. My goodness, I, I guess I guess there's no slowing down in retirement. How's life? Life's good, man. Definitely changed since uh, I was spending every day with you. That's for sure. But um it's been great. You know what I mean? It's um, I, like you said, I'm married. I have a kid now. And being a father is, is probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. And as you know, Joel, we've done some cool things together in our life and we've got to experience some cool moments. But um, that's my day to day now, man. I'll get on and do something like this in the morning during his nap time. And then when he gets up and he's ready to roll, I'm chasing him around daily and we're trying to get outside doing some activities. So I'm having a blast with it. So you already going oppo? He's I'm def hey, he's throwing with the left hand already. So we <laughs> he'll take a ball, grab it, and like spike it right down. But it's every time it's with the left hand. So 
I am uh, making a point to just get the ball in that left hand. If it's ever in the right hand, I'll shift it right over. There we go. I, I don't know. Yeah, we don't need him turning in a moose here. Come on. I mean, you know, you got to got to be able to throw left, hit left. I, it was the coolest thing. I, I know I texted you back in October to wish you a happy birthday, and you immediately sent me a video of him waking up and getting out of the crib. I've never seen that side of you. I, it's not that I couldn't envision it. I, I knew at some point that that would, would come, and – you know, I, I know that you were an uncle before you were a father, but you, you just talked about it being life changing. What What is it like to, to be dad every day? Oh, it's incredible, man. And I always had so much fun. You know, guys would bring their their kids in the locker room after the game. And, you know, I would stay there sometimes 30, 40 minutes after a game and be be Ma Mossy's catcher when uh, Esky is getting treatment or something like that. Or, you know, Max Man would come in and Gordo was working out and I'd be hanging out with him. So it was always something I, I really did enjoy. Never, um, I definitely envisioned having a kid at some point, but never knew when it was going to come. And man, when he was born in Boston a couple of years ago, it was just like, um, it was a tough time for me because I was on the DL or the IL and I was going to the field, getting my treatment and all that type of stuff. And I wanted to be home with him and, and just, you know, being just there for him, you know what I mean? So now that I get to spend some more time with him and I get to enjoy that and put everything into him is, is going to be fun and i'm i'm having so much fun with it it's, it's so cool and i you know when you list off some of those kids i mean i saw max gordon you mentioned max uh alex gordon's oldest the other day he's in seventh grade i mean come on that that's ridiculous he's, he was at uh, uh gordo was getting inducted into the college baseball hall of fame so so my son who you first knew when he was four no five probably six is now 21 and he and i went and there, there's Max Gordon in a suit with a shirt unbuttoned and the, the gold <laughs> chain or whatever it was. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, the Jordans, what is going on here? So they, you know, they grow up. It's it's only a matter of time until we see some of those kids maybe get drafted and, you know, and follow in debt. Not all of them, but 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 some of them will. Uh, there, there's so much I want to talk about. Before we get into the career and the leadership and 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 just this incredible journey, I want to ask you about the, the, the production company because, you know, you you didn't just jump into this. You, you, you're not just occasionally appearing on a podcast. This is a business now for you. When I when I saw that you were going to be involved and you know you, you have a production company now, I, I knew that it would have to be tied. You know, I, I mentioned in the intro that there's so many guys that maybe people don't remember or never got to know that were were as cool to meet as the quote unquote superstars. One of them, I knew it from the beginning, was Anthony Saratelli. Mm -hmm. When when you were all bouncing around as as young kids you know it was you and moose and saratelli and clint robinson and like all these kind of hodgepodge of guys that went different ways but you knew from the beginning that anthony saratelli would be in in he would be making movies films shows whatever it was so how did this whole thing come about yeah that's that's the funny and unique part about you know what we had in kansas city was there's so many guys in the minor leagues that were such a big part of what we did over there and, you know, didn't make it to the big leagues with Kansas City. They were, you know, some of them went on to other organizations. Uh, Anthony went on to Japan, played, had a great career there. But it was such a tight-knit group. And I think for guys like myself and Moose, when, you know, we're 18, 19 years old and we're spending every day with guys like Telly and guys like Clint and all that, you know, we understood what it was to grow up. These guys were were grown men. They were, you know, uh, paying bills and, and living real life. And, that was something that that really I think was was awesome for us to be around those guys to see how they handled everything, just to see how professional they were was huge. But um, you know, Anthony and I always kept in touch, even um, you know after his playing days were over. Anytime we ever went to New York or or we're in uh, you know a city that he was in, we always caught up. And and um, you know, last year when I was with the Cubs, we had started floating around the idea of when I was done playing of doing something like this, you know, because he was in. The production side the server side of this industry for about 10 years with jersey filmmaker and he had done a bunch of stuff with showtime he had done some stuff at uh, floyd mayweather's house for 24 7 so you know he definitely knew the the ins and outs and the production side and how to do all this stuff and you know i made it very clear to him when i when we do this i don't want to be breaking news or i don't want to be uh telling telling this team needs to trade this team or this team's going to trade this guy we just want to dive into some stories, some deeper stories with guys. We want to uh, hear, you know, about sometimes where guys face some adversity and how they responded to it. I've always, especially the last couple of years of my career, I've taken a liking of helping out younger guys, especially when I wasn't playing every day. I would find someone to, 
you know, Raul Banya has always told me, find someone to love on someday. You know, you can help somebody out, whether it's with baseball or off the field or whatever it was. So when I got done playing, I wanted to continue to do that. And instead of just having a relationship with the guys that are already, you know, I'm texting in my phone or calling, I wanted to expand that. So this is something we feel that can expand that a little bit. We can reach the youth. We can reach minor leaguers. We can reach big leaguers, whoever it is. We just want to help out and we're excited to share stories and do all that stuff. Shocking. You you dudes of Cuban descent, you know, coming together. Raul Abana is as, as good of a leader. I've told people over and over again, I'll, I'll go off on some tangents here that, that I know Royals fans will appreciate. I hope everybody will, but but Raul Ibanez was one of the most important pieces of that 2014 World Series team that just fell short of winning it all. And if you look at this is what I tell audiences so often. If you look at the stats, like in business, if you look at the business, it doesn't tell the whole picture. Go find yourself Raul Ibanez's playoff stats in 2014. He wasn't on the playoff roster, yet you all gravitated towards him. He was like that father figure, right? He had such, such respect from everybody. Everybody knew about his career. We got to see him on a day-to-day -day basis. We saw how humble he was. And, you know, that year in 14, there was a big, um, you know, it, the speech that he gave us in Chicago got mm -hmm. a lot of attention. And, you know, I feel like every year you hear, oh, you know, this guy gave that speech and it turned it around. But his truly did. And I'll never forget that speech because, you know, he came in there in the clubhouse and he basically just told us, you know, do you guys know what other dugouts, what other teams think of you guys? Do you know how they fear you guys? I was just in that other dugout a couple of weeks ago, and, and this is what guys think of you. So to hear him say that kind of, you know, got some stuff going for us and gave us this instant just confidence boost that we're like, damn, we are pretty good. If, if Raul is saying this, like I was just watching this dude with the Yankees hit homers in October the last two, three years, and if he's saying this, then we 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 got something over here. And and that was the speech that got us going. And I will say that was part of the biggest heartbreak of 2014 was not being able to get Raul a ring. Cause I think everybody in that clubhouse and he is humble, he won't say it, but we truly wanted to send that guy off the right way and get him a ring. So I think that's one of the first things when you think of the heartbreak of 2014, that's one of the first things that comes to our minds for sure. You know, he's someone and I, I wrote about him in my book as well. I mean, it's a fascinating story because his his parents were from Cuba, just like your mom, mm -hmm. and his brothers were were born in Cuba. I mean, your mom came over to the States before some of her siblings were born, some of some of your uncles and aunts, I think. But in his case, he was the one that was born in the United States. His brothers were born in Cuba. So he's born, I think, in the Bronx. And then 40 years later, he's pinch hitting for A-Rod hitting a playoff home run at Yankee stadium, not too far from where he was born. And, you know, his dad was, I think like a high level chemist in Cuba and, and then had to come in and do lesser jobs in the United States to make it work. The sacrifice for his family. The thing that he said to me, you and I were talking before we got on unrelated, but, but it is related um, about other stuff, but you were talking about, you know, Hey, when this person walked into the, the clubhouse, we kind of ran the other way. And I tell people all the time, like, I'm not one of you guys. I, 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 you all have your own deserved fraternity and, and on a very frequent and regular basis, you let me in on that fraternity. And I also understand that I'm not going to go too far with that. It's your house. It's your family. And, and you guys consider me a part of that family, which is an incredible honor, but my, like, I don't say this out loud, but my mantra, and I tell audiences this, my mantra when I walk into a big league clubhouse, and even if I had played, so maybe there's a little more credibility, but I didn't. Um, my mantra when I walk into a clubhouse is when I walk in, I don't want guys walking the other way. And the way that you do that is by by being real, by, by being who you say you're going to be, where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there. If I ask you for one minute, don't make it 10 minutes and 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 read the room. If, if Moose looks like he's distracted that day, if Moose looks like something's going on, I'm going to give him some space. Mm -hmm. And and you can do that by looking. It was impossible during the pandemic because we weren't face-to-face. -face. But uh, Ibanya said about reading the room, if you're a bull in a china shop, you'll never notice. And th those were his sort of words of wisdom. And I'm just curious about that because, and I don't mean to make it about me, I just did, but I've always said that you had this ability to connect with everyone. And baseball, like any other sport, like any other office, in any other profession, 
can get clicky. It just does. You know, in, in the yeah. baseball world, the Latins may be here. The pitchers are here. The hitters are here. Um, oftentimes the black guys are over here. The white guys are over here. And, and you were with everyone. H how did that happen? Well, first of all, that's everyone, you know, legitimately liked each other and we all got along. And I think one of the things that um, I don't even know if this is the right way to say it, but kind of gave me credibility with a lot of the guys, especially the Latin guys, was my mom was from Cuba. So my mom, when we were in the minor leagues, she would come visit and we'd see her after a game. And, you know, Salvi would walk by and she'd start talking to her in, or talking to him in Spanish. And a lot of the guys didn't even know I was Cuban until they met my mom. So you know, guys like Brian Pena and a lot of the Cuban players, Kendry Morales, when they found that out, it was like they were kind of looking at me like a younger brother. And they made it a point to take me under their wing and were showing me the ropes and all that type of stuff. So I think that's something that really helped, you know, all that come about. And then guys like Raul, that's part of what they do. They understand to be a successful team. We got to bring everybody together. We have to make everybody, even if you don't like each other, we have to make it a way to where, when we come in here every single day, we need to make this environment a fun environment for everyone to come in. If you sit down at the lunch table, you're not picking and choosing where you're sitting. You can sit down, feel comfortable with anybody. And that's kind of how it was. And and guys like Raul, they they taught us the ropes of, you know, when Joel came in after the game, it's like, listen, Joel is on our side. Like this is something that he has to do. This is his due diligence that if you make, you know, the the, the error that loses the game, He's got a job to do, and he's got to come ask you about that and ask you what happened in that play. And that's why this is the big league level. you got to understand as a professional and as a big leaguer, you have a job to do as well. And sometimes after the game, when people ask you questions, you got to speak on what happened after the game. Now, there's professionalism on all levels to that. You know what I mean? That's If you came in there after a game and I made an error and you're like, Eric, tell me about American Heritage High School and your career there. It's like, Joel. This isn't the time for that. Yep. You know what I mean? So I think that balance and that feel is something that you had very well. And, you know, that's why the guys loved you. And, and you were the best sideline reporter I had. I will say that. And, you know, that's because of that reputation of, listen, this guy's not trying to bash anybody. This guy's not trying to air out any dirty laundry. He's not, you know, trying to listen to other guys have a conversation and then say it on air because nope. players know it always gets back to the player. And and I wasn't a guy that mm -hmm. went back and watched the broadcast or the or whatever, but my mom knew everything. My dad knew everything. My uncle knew everything. Mm -hmm. So if there was stuff that were being said about you in a negative way, a player is going to find out about yeah. it, you know? Well, my, my whole thing was always this. And I'll, I'll, I'll at least back up and say that in my role, I don't have to go in and ask those questions after I know what you're saying. But I do. And like, I mean, how many times did I have you as my live guest after a game and have to talk about, you know, a brawl with Jordano Ventura? And 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 I had to ask you, though, like the talk. But my whole thing is this, because I live with you guys, is that no one's ever told me what to say and what not to say. If you're 0 for 25, you're 0 for 25. I'm not going to say you're doing great, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to say you suck. I'm not going to say this guy is dogging it. I mean, the reality of it is that every now and then you do get somebody that might be dogging it. And yeah you guys quietly will let me know that and not in a way to embarrass him in a way to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pump that guy up or say that he's working hard. I'm probably just going to leave it alone. Right. There are plenty of people on talk radio or in the newspaper that can, could go out there and, and destroy a guy. And, and there there's, there's a place for that, whether people like it or not, it's not my style to begin with. So I think that's why it, it works for me to have the role that I do, but no one ever questioned me for going on the air. I'm talking players and families and saying this team's not good right now, right? Because you already knew that. I all, but but then the question becomes: What are you doing to get out of it? What mm -hmm. are you doing to work on it, so that I could talk about that? Right. And it's not just they don't care. And so I just think it, it's it's not what you say; it's how you say it. There are mm -hmm. ways to talk about a guy not playing well without making him look like a piece of garbage. It's it, 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 it's pretty simple, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think, too, from a player side, the players have a lot of respect for the guys in the media that are there every day. You know, when you're there day to day, you do have a, a, a pulse of what's going on. Like you're not in the locker room, you know, all day, every day. So there's certain things that you don't see or there's certain things that get by you. But at the end of the day, when you're there every single day covering the team, you're outside in batting practice, you're in the locker room whenever you can be. So, yeah, you do have a strong opinion because you're there every day. So I think that is something that the guys can respect. You know, I remember when I first got called up, 
Dick Cagle and Bob Dutton, those guys were pretty much there every single yeah. day. And they were both awesome. And they would always come up to me on those bad games and be like, hey, Eric, you know what happened out there, blah, blah, blah. And they would always at the end of the interview say, listen, I'll be here tomorrow when you get four hits. And to me, that was awesome because it felt yeah. like, you know, hey, they're doing their job. They have a due diligence to report on what the game ha on what happened with the game. And they're doing that. But they're not trying to bash me. They have to do that because that's what happened in the game. So I think that was something that I was like, man, that's pretty cool. And that could be, you know, benefits of playing in a smaller market where, mm -hmm. you know, Kansas City is different, even from the fans. Uh, something I told Bobby Witt when I was talking to him in, in Arizona was the fans will never boo you for a bad performance. When they start booing you is because they see your effort is not what it should be. They see that your energy is a little down mm -hmm. and they're trying to boost you up a little bit. There's certain markets where they expect you to be, you know, this high level player day in and day out. And if you're not living up to that, they're going to boo the shit out of you. You know what yeah. I mean? That's just what it is. So I just think it was such a there's so many there's so much that goes on on a day to day basis on a team. And there's so many guys. And one of the guys that we brought up all the time and before this was Dyson mm -hmm. and Gerard Dyson had such a pulse on what was going on with the team, what was going on with the media so if there was that little, you know, kind of awkwardness going on between player and media, Dice would walk right up to him and be like, hey, man, what's the deal? And he would make sure that would kind of clear on the spot so there's no lingering issues. He was not afraid, that's for sure. I, I, I got along so well with Dice, one of my favorites. And he, he didn't like it the night, one of the celebration nights where I kicked over his, his very expensive bottle of champagne. <laughs> but it was like behind a curtain. What are you doing, Joe? Anyway, you know. Hey, and you didn't like, I'll never forget this, because this was the first time you texted me after a game. You're like, did I do something wrong? But so when I hit the walk-off homer off of Greg I Holland. I about to bring this up. Yeah. Well, no, so, let me give you my perspective first. Okay, go ahead. Give you go my ahead, perspective go first. I think you and I talked about this when I was writing my book, but – I just have to tell everybody, and I'm like, I don't know if it's lucky or not. I, I mean, I'd like to think it's because I go about my job the right way, but I, guys don't, guys almost never say no to me. Now, okay, fine, they're turning the respect, but again, that's also understanding that there's a time and a place, and, and, and I know when guys aren't up for it. I can see it in their body language, so you give them the space on that one, uh, but nobody, very rarely will anybody ever say no to me for a post-game interview after being the star of the game. Would you rather get in there and not get dunked with the bucket? Sure. But but everybody says yes. And guaranteed 100% success rate with Eric Cosmer <laughs> in his career. It never, ever, ever, ever said a no. And he hits a walk-off home run against former teammate, a guy that I know is already in it or that is in a text chain to this day with all the, the world champions, Greg Holland, who's now with, I believe, Colorado. Yeah. And there's only one player to interview after that game, and it's you, and you said no, and I knew exactly why, and I believe a text – well, a text came to me probably while I was in the middle of my post-game show from you. I'll let you take it from there. Yes. So, I honestly, I wouldn't have minded doing the interview, and it, it wouldn't have felt like I was disrespecting Greg, but when we're piling at home plate, people were ripping my jersey apart. And I was a guy, Billy Butler called it bareback, and I wouldn't wear an undershirt. So these guys are ripping my jersey apart. So I'm like, oh, so I'm there with a shredded jersey. And if I looked like Alex Gordon under my jersey, I would have had no problem doing the interview. <laughs> I would have stood out there with my chest hanging out, being like, all right, Joel, let's talk about it. But I don't. So I'm like, I need to get inside right now because I'm going to be a meme on the Internet. Someone's going to be making fun of me. I need to get in there right now. So the reason I didn't do it was because these guys ripped open my jersey and I wasn't feeling too secure about what I look like under uh, under the jersey there, so I just ran inside. But I'll never forget, I was so confused because you text me after that, and you're like, hey, man, was there something I did? Well, is there something wrong, or did you just not want to disrespect Greg? No, I, I don't and think I was, was like, that. oh, I had no idea. Uh, I, that's I the only reason why I didn't do it. I don't think it was quite that. I mean, we, we, we forget as we go along, but it, 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 I might be wrong, too. Uh, I'm the old guy here, but, but my memory is I probably said something to Mike, Mike Swanson, the GM, like, what the heck? And then he said something to you, and you replied something like, "Hey, don't don't go crying over the well, live." I won't say exactly how you said it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just 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 guy talk. I think, but you're like, I I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to go in in front of the camera with no shirt on. You know, I love you, all that. And I was <laughs> I was never heard about it at all. It was just it caught me off guard. I still to this day call bullshit because 
Um, it's not like you're fat or anything like that. I, <laughs> I, I, I still think that you were trying not to show up. Your your teammate who had to your ex teammate who had to walk off with his head down um, in a place that he called home. Yeah, that, I mean, that definitely has a little bit to do with it. I had an easy out, so I was like, all right, this is going to be that. But <laughs> yeah, man, it was it it was because you know, Greg, man, I saw Greg. In the mound, on the mound in Cleveland, Greg, as we all know, threw about 98 miles an hour with a nasty slider. His slider would get up to about 90 miles an hour. And I'll never forget, Greg was on the mound in Cleveland, and he was throwing fastballs at like 86 miles an hour. And he did two in a row, and we, me and Moose kind of looked at each other on the field, and we're like, we're like, time. And we go to the mound, and we're like, Greg, what's wrong, dude? Like, something's wrong. And he's like, nah, what are you talking about? Everything's fine. Get back to your position. And we're like, all right, all right, dude. Like, yeah, well, all right. So he ends up getting the save, gets out of the game on the training table. And sure enough, that's when he blew out. Mm -hmm. So I had, we had so much re respect for Greg, man. Like this guy would never say no to getting the ball. You know, there's a lot of closers now and I'm not trying to like call them out or anything. But right now. Yeah. There's a lot of closers where it's like, Hey, if I throw two days in a row, I don't want to throw that third day. Greg was like, dude, give me the ball anytime you need me in there. So the respect that we had for him was just through the roof. So maybe a little bit of that did kind of cross my mind of uh, I'm not going to show him up in yeah. that way. Well, he was the ultimate warrior. I mean, this is a dude, not a big guy either, that was fearless. I mean, he'd pitch 10 days in a row if, if you didn't stop him, and that yep. would be with a, a shoulder or anything that was messed up. I'm calling him out if for some reason he's listening. I think he sent me something last year. Why don't you have me on the podcast? And I promise you if I ask him 10 more times, like, no, no, I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't love the spotlight, but I, but I, 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 I'm speaking for him. I don't know, but the ultimate teammate, right? Like, I mean, you go to battle with guys like Greg Holland. 100%. And he's a guy that grinded all the way through the minor leagues, was never at the top of any prospect list or anything like that. Uh, put up numbers everywhere he went, got to the big leagues, put up numbers, got to the closer role, never looked back from there. So, yeah, Greg's a guy that he's earned everything he's gotten. And he's a guy, like you said, he doesn't like the spotlight, but he's a guy that needs to be heard. And he is yeah. quite the character when he's, he's on, funny. when he's in the spotlight. That dude, like totally different backgrounds and totally different dudes, but there's some similarities in Dyson and Holland in the sense that they both have a lot to say. They're both competitors. They're both funny as shit. Mm -hmm. But by the way, I don't usually swear on this show. We'll just check the box for yes. But once you drop the <laughs> shit, I'm in with you. Like, how often do we ever get to do that on the air, right? Yeah, exactly. We're, better, we're making better new way. ways. But yeah, it's yeah. one to one now. So I'll, I'll I'll be cool on the rest of them. No, you can. No, I got you. I got two or three. You got a couple left, and if you want to even things up, that's, <laughs> that's all good. Um, I, I'm gonna get to some favorite memories and all that type of stuff. The obvious questions, but I want to. You know, when you retired. Uh, one of the local radio stations asked me to give some memories and I, I, I gave a couple, I think they were probably looking for, you know, like the mad dash home and that type of stuff, but mine were more, you know, relational. And I, I think the story that always stands out to me, I tell this to audiences when I'm talking about, when I'm speaking about the topic of accountability, you know, I would never give anything away that was really private, but this was such a great story. And it was whatever year, 16 or 17. You got people forget they say it was just a two-year run. You guys, you guys had every expectation of winning it all in 16 and 17. You fell short. Yep. So you'll remember the game, whatever year, 16 or 17, we're in St. Petersburg, and you get picked off of first base uh, against the Tampa Bay Rays. And you're on first, Kane's on second, you're down one. I think it's the sixth inning. Base hit ties the game, extra base hit gives you the lead. Who knows? Maybe, you know, what if you fall one game short of making the playoffs? Like this, every game mattered a lot at that point. And I remember as as, as is the case for me and Jeff Montgomery as we're watching a game, the storyline can change 25 times. What matters in the fifth may not have anything to do with it. But I remember thinking if you guys lose this game that, you know, that you could lose the game and maybe fall one game short because of that mistake. Mm -hmm. And so that would certainly be a topic we were going to talk about fairly, of course, and then they came back to win and all the media came up to you afterwards. And you said, look, I, I just messed up. I misread the picture. And, you know, we ran that soundbite on the post game show. And then I was lucky enough to have been invited to, to grab a drink with, with you and, you know, your mom and your dad and your brother and your uncle and, and Moose was with us. And, and somebody asked you, I, I it was probably your, your brother, or your uncle uh, said, Hey, what happened on that play? 
it wasn't me. I'm not in a reporting mode at that point. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> you know, so honored that you're including me and I'm, I'm not asking much of anything. It's the rare time where I'm just shutting up. And uh, somebody asked you, you said, well, I, you know, I dove back in and tagged me out. And Rusty Koontz, the now legendary first base coach of the Royals, says, I, Haas, I, I messed up the read. I, I sold you out there. <laughs> and my story to that, it's just a great story to tell because it, it's who you are as a person. Uh, it, and how many times do we see someone, and I, if you're friends with them, I apologize, but you know, go back to the, the mess in the 2015 ALCS where that ball drops between Batista and Goins. And, you know, right. Batista says, talk to Goins. And, you know, one of the great home run hitters of his time. But that would have never come out of your mouth. You would have found a way to, just like Holland with the, the, the walk-off home run, you would have found a way to not show up a guy. And I love that story because my, my moral of the story is how much courage or confidence does it take to take the blame even when it's not yours? And how good does that feel to your teammates, your coaches, when they know he's got my back? Am I am I recalling all of that correctly? No, you definitely are. And, and, and that's something that was so special about that group is we all had the trust in each other. And I think the biggest thing you try and do is you're trying to limit distractions as much as you can for the team. And – for me, that person or that one situation would have caused, I feel like, a, a whole different stir. If I were to say, oh, Rusty gave me the read and it was wrong. And, you know, Rusty, Ned, all those guys, time and time again, went to bat for us in the media, continued to stick up for us, especially in those years where stuff wasn't good. And there was a lot of discussion on, you know, should this guy be here? Should this guy be in AAA and all that type of thing? And they just continued to go to bat for us. So we just felt like as players, how do we limit the distractions as much as possible? And that is, you know, if there's something that you have to take the blame for, take the blame for it. It's not that big of a deal. The game, the scenario is not going to change. We lost. We're, you know, like you said, we're probably going to be out of the playoffs at this point. But there's no need to go and, and create a whole different deal about Rusty giving me the wrong sign and the wrong read and all that type of stuff. So. To me, that was just where we went above and beyond, and that's how good the culture was, was because we did limit those distractions. And, you know, one that comes to my mind, and even to this day, I still get questions about it, and I can't stand it because I don't even think it's a discussion, but the 2014 World Series, when they talk about should Jersh, Jersh should have sent Gordon home, and I'm like, you guys are out of your mind. There's totally no agree. way Gordon – like. Gordo will tell you himself, he was slowing down a little bit from second to third. Not only that, Brandon Crawford had the baseball. This guy's got, if there's a, a rating, it's a 99 arm, accuracy, strength, all that type of stuff. So you got Buster Posey catching the throw. This is the Major League Baseball. Like, who in their right mind would have thought that Alex Gordon would have made that? So the heat that Jersh gets from that, just from the outside perspective, obviously it's a worldwide perspective everyone's watching. To this day, I'm like, I don't get that. Like, that is just, if you're a baseball person, you know there's no way you would have made it. Jersh would have been fired if he sent him. No doubt. It looks so much worse if he sends him and he's out. And then you got Salvador Perez, who's one of the best catcher, hitting catchers of all time. So, like, okay, like, that's a whole different narrative now. So, that's that's one that you just really can't control those things. So, you try and limit them as much as possible. By the way not intending to make it worse the handful of times gordo has said you never know is not actually his opinion that is just his <laughs> dry sense of humor because alex gordon can stir the pot with the best of them he just <laughs> will do it with the slightest smirk on his face you yeah, don't even yeah, need a yeah. lie detector test but if you really ask him he'll tell you because gordo always had that uh he was always passionate about his speed and i think he thought he was a lot faster than he was so that's probably where that comes from I, I just learned not to shake his hand ever because if he extended a hand with a batting glove, there was pine tar on it, and I wore yeah. that the rest <laughs> of the damn day. You guys, you know, would mess with me. They still do to this day. That, that's when I know everything is okay because it's never malicious. It's, it's always fun. The other one um, that I, I – by the way, like for everybody listening, if you'll notice – as I talk about Haas's leadership, it's always we, we, we. It's never I, which is – which is. <laughs> I mean, if you pay attention, the best – this isn't just you – the, the 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 best professionals to me in terms of leadership are the ones that say I when you messed up and we when things went right. You know, I, it's a good veteran pitcher will say I, I threw a bad pitch. And then when it's, it's a strikeout, it's we threw a good pitch or Salvi called a good. It, it, it's 
it's such a simple, subtle thing. But if you pay attention to it, I and we will tell you a lot. I, I want to talk about your Donald Ventura in a couple of ways, because, you know, I referenced before wanting and interviewing you in, in tough moments. I remember when the brawl happened in Chicago. I don't remember what year. People are better at that than me. I don't know if you remember or not. But, you know, well, it, it, it was probably 15. I'm yeah, guessing. I think it was 15, yeah. Because that was the year that the whole league had it out to get you guys because everybody assumed that you were a, a, a fluke and they wanted to test you because mm -hmm. they didn't think that you could be the big bully. But you were, and you pushed back. Now you start to push your Donald Ventura, some crazy things can happen. And so, I mean, Chris Sale tried to come into the clubhouse that night. There's a whole <laughs> brawl. It wasn't the first. And I just remember thinking, like, this, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but this is my mindset. Like, I don't, I don't try to get the same guy back-to-back -back nights as my post-game start. Now, if Salvi has big homers back-to-back -back nights, I'm getting him and he expects me to get him and I'll do it four <laughs> nights in a row and he'll tell you it's his show and all the fun stuff that comes with Salvi, right? But for the most part, I want to mix it up. I don't want to wear guys out. And, you know, I'm not going to typically get a guy if they're over. But that night, I just remember, and I'd have to look up the box score, thinking I, as long as Haas gets one hit, as long as he does something, great defensive play, whatever, I don't really care what the rest of it is. You're the only guy I need because I think that you're going to talk very passionately about what went on. And you did. And, and you did it in a way that, didn't call out your Dono necessarily, but you made it very clear that as a team, you guys had to clean some things up and and that that this was going to be discussed. What do you remember about that? Because things were very heated. Yeah, they were. And, and it was a point in time. It, it was tough because it's a balance, right? If what was so awesome about our pitching staff when Jordano, Volquez, Cueto, and even Herrera and the whole bullpen was – the way they protected their position players, us as the position players, if anybody ever got hit or anybody got knocked down, it's unwritten rules, right? There's That was what the game was when I was coming up. And sure, it might be like that today, but it's definitely not as much of that going on. So if any of us got hit or even brushed back, it was known amongst our pitchers. Nobody would say anything. They would almost just look at each other. And they were drilling guys. And they were just drilling guys, letting them know, like, listen – your guy started that. He threw up and in the moose. That's why I'm doing this. Like they had our backs so much. Then it got to the point where it got it got a little out of hand. <laughs> and Jordano, you know, he God, he was such a. It was so fun because Jordano was the first like young guy to come up, and we can feel like we're like the veteran presence for him now. So we can start kind of teaching him stuff. And there was a game against Detroit, and Kinsler and I talk about this a lot. Um, so Miguel Amante came up, and he's from Dominican, and he throws in the eighth inning. I think it's his major league debut, and he throws to Kinsler. Kinsler hits him deep. Next day, Jordano's starting. First pitch of the game puts one right in his ribs, and we're like, ooh. <laughs> oh, no. So we're like, Poppy, why'd you do that? He's like, he take my he, he hit home run off my friend. And we're like, all right, there's got to be a balance to this. Like this, we can't just keep doing this. You know what I mean? You can't just hit guys because he took your friend deep. So it was like, it was hard because it was, there was a couple times where it was like, listen, we don't need to do this. But at the same time, when these guys have your backs the way they did, you can't, it's hard to tell them not to do it. So there was definitely a balance in that. But, um, you know, man, what was so crazy about Jordano was was we all saw the strides he was making and how much he was growing up. And just a terrible story, man, uh, the way it ended up, uh, you know, whatever happened to him. But but that was that was something I will never forget about that pitching staff and those guys were they didn't speak about it. They would have our backs instantly. You know, with Ace, I I talk about it a lot in my speeches because I learned a lot from him. I, I learned how to connect with the Latin guys from him. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pujols was the first guy, the super first superstar that that I finally got the trust of. And it took me seven years to learn how to do that. That's a different that wasn't a uh you know American Latin. But Ventura is the first guy where I, I finally understood how scary it was. Because if you talk to Ventura in the clubhouse, you know, he'd walk in in basketball shorts and a fancy polo and like nice shoes with, with those basketball shorts with that unique voice and as loud as can be. And like, he was a character mm -hmm. and 
he made people laugh. I mean, he was lovable, but he had demons. I mean, a lot of people do. And and then, you know, this tragic um, death in Dominican and in the car accident and stuff going on. But, I, you know, he he was that lovable little brother that could drive you nuts a lot of times. You and I yeah. talked about this privately. I won't get into all of it. I mean, I remember texting with you after an incident in Baltimore with what would be your future teammate, Manny Machado. And again, mm -hmm. issues there. But then I'll forever remember the day that he passed in 2017. It was a Sunday morning. I think we all woke up and saw the news or the rumors, and then it was confirmed. And, and I just remember texting you and, and you saying, man, he's, he, he was family, you know, he was, and, and you went down to the, to the Dominican. I, I, I talked years ago with Joe Girardi about this. I don't remember how it came up, but he was managing the Yankees. And I, I just remember when, when Daryl Kyle, this is before your time, but I mean, you were obviously no, no, a kid. St. Louis, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you would remember at least as a kid, I was, I wasn't traveling with the Cardinals. I was on local news, but, but he died in his hotel room and they had to cancel the game against the Cubs at Wrigley. And Girardi was the veteran catcher now. Um, for the Cubs, and he had to get on the microphone and his voice cracking and announce to the crowd that there's been a death in the Cardinal family and we have to postpone the game, and his voice was cracking. And, um, you know, I mean, everybody in tears, all this stuff. And I said to him that I was talking about you, and I said how hard that must have been. Um, he, he made the comment to me that, that a, accountability is taking stuff for others, doing stuff for others. He said that what he had to do that day was nothing compared to what you had to do in speaking on opening day. And I know it's not a comparison, but that th th this was your teammate. He, this was not his teammate. This was just somebody in the baseball fraternity. He just had to make an announcement. You had to address a whole crowd on opening day. Opening day is, you know, 35, 36, 37,000, 40,000 sold out. You've been to the Dominican for, for the funeral. Um, the images were just gut wrenching from what I could see from a distance. Um, what do you remember of that day? Like you don't strike me as a guy that ever gets nervous that you rise to the occasion, but this is, this is a whole different animal having to, to honor your teammate in front of all those fans. Yeah. I think first of all, what made me realize how close of a group we were and still are was as soon as that happened, I mean, we, everybody coordinated a buying up or renting a plane, getting to Florida, Moose, Cali to Florida, Dyson, Mississippi to Florida, Holland, North Carolina to Florida. And we all flew back because I was in Boston at the time when it happened. And we all got to Florida that day. Next morning, first thing in the morning, we take a flight to Dominican. We go to, to Ace's house. We go to the service. We go to the funeral. We, you know, we're there with his family and all that type of stuff. And just looking around at the whole entire town, looking around at the the baseball fields there, his house. I mean, Ace literally, he was the guy for this town. He he kind of built that town, it seemed like. It seemed like everything was going because of Ace's success. I mean, if you look at the gas station there, it had a picture of him on there. You look at the, the Little League field, it was his Little League field. There was guys playing in Royals jerseys. I mean, all up and down the street was all Royals, all Ace, everything. So I just remember all of us on the bus. It was about a three-hour ride from San, uh, Santa Domingo to Las Terenas. That was where he was up in the mountains. And just seeing him, um, his body, seeing his mother, how hard it hit her, we just all were like, man, we have to continue to live his legacy. And we're going to do this for his family. We're going to do this for Las Terenas, that whole entire town. But we just felt like it was on us to continue to live out his legacy. So when that moment happened, it was – it was nothing I really like tried to think about. I just knew that Ace was the most comfortable in his life when he was on that mound, when he was in front of everybody in Kansas City because of how much he took a likening to being in Kansas City. So it was just kind of straight from the heart. But it was um, just, you know, I'm not much of a crier, man. And I've that was the second time, it was, or the first time. And then the second time I cried when the last time we all walked off the field and I interviewed with you. But there was just so much, so many emotions that you just felt a due diligence to live out, continue to live out his legacy for him, for his family. And, you know, I knew Moose would have got up there, done the same thing. Salvi would have got up there, do the same thing. Esky, Holland, all those guys. So that was, you know, that was one of the toughest moments in our career, because at that point in time, you don't, you don't give a shit about the game. All you care about yeah. is at this moment in time and, 
I don't even remember the game. I don't even remember who we played, how whatever happened after that. I just that that speech and talking about him and uh it was something that just wouldn't leave your mind that whole day and and it's something that you always bring up on Twitter which I love because you always post the picture. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that, you know, I I look forward to now because I know you're going to post it and it's like a day where we can all kind of you know, catch up on ace stories. It always finds a way to bring the group together at some point in time or somehow. You got a favorite ace story? Maybe I'll share it on Twitter next year. Um, let me see. So the the Manny story, like you're saying, I'll never forget that one. Manny, he hit Manny in Baltimore. That created a, another bench clearing brawl. And we're sitting there after, and we were actually, we're in the shower. It was me, Volquez, and Ace. And we're just kind of like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Ace, man, you can't keep doing this, man. And he's like, what, Papa, what, what? And I'm like, you can't just keep hitting guys for no reason, man. Like, that's not right. You know what I mean? Like, no. And then like, we kind of like, Volky was just like, it's okay, Bubba, I'll talk to him, all that. And the next day I came up to him and I apologized to Ace. And I'm like, hey, man, listen, I just need to, I need to have your back. Whether you're right, you're wrong, it doesn't matter. I need to have your back as a teammate, as a brother, as a friend, whatever you want to call it. That's on me for not having your back right away. Like I'll have your back right away, and then we'll answer. We'll ask questions later. But it's something I've talked to Manny about too. In that moment, I was mad at myself because I hesitated, and I'm like, man, why is he doing this? But at the end of the day. He never hesitated for me. He never hesitated for Moose. He would just react whether it was right or wrong and protect us. So I felt like it was it was my bad not just protecting him right away and then asking the questions later. That happened by later that afternoon because we were we I, I just remember walking back from like a late breakfast and texting with you and you were you were still a little hot over it. You know that stuff obviously never comes out. Yeah, but nothing that you and I ever would have texted would would right. come out. It just I always was able to get the pulse. That that's you know what you hope for in trust a, a couple more before I wind things down with, with, with a few other questions. How do you, I mean, I, I love talking about this topic. How do you build trust yourself in a clubhouse? I, I know when I read the comments that the Cubs let you go, it wasn't because they didn't want you there. They just didn't, they didn't have room anymore. They, they, they wanted you there to be that guy in the clubhouse. Uh, how do you, how did you go about building trust? For me, you do it over the long haul. You can't go in there. You know, even in San Diego, when I first, my first year going over there, I mean, Will Myers is basically the only guy that I know of going into that clubhouse. And at that point in time, he's probably had, you know, three, four years in the big leagues. And at that, and anybody else didn't have over a year or two in the big leagues. So I'm going into a new clubhouse and I want to learn what's, you know, who are the guys right now in the clubhouse? What is the pulse of this clubhouse? I'm not going in there day one trying to be like, this is what we need to do. This is it, blah, blah, blah. So to me, I think that kind of, you earn that trust over the long period of time. And in Chicago, it was a unique situation for me because, you know, I signed there on a one-year deal, everything in San Diego, you know, I just gotten traded the year before there was, you know, always the trade rumors coming up the last two years. Then I finally get traded to Boston and I get hurt in Boston and they tell me before they have a young first baseman they want to build around, which I completely get and understand. So then I go to Chicago and then it's kind of the same thing. They have a young first baseman that, you know, they eventually want to take over. So I don't know if that's the right mindset to have, but I go in there and I'm like, listen, I'm just a role guy and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy, you know, not having to have the stress of playing every day. And the days that I don't play, I'm going to be that Raul Abanez. I'm going to make a, you know, a relationship with Edwin Rios or a Nick Madrigal. And, you know, the young guys that are in that role position are frustrated because they want to play every single day. And, they want to prove themselves. So, you know, it was always fun for me to find ways to keep those guys ready, uh, motivate those guys and continue to just tell them like, Hey man, your opportunity is going to come. You don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. You don't know if it's going to be next year, but we got to stay ready. And that was fun for me. It really was because it was a whole different perspective and it just gave me a whole different look of the game. All right. I ask you, I, I think I might've put this in the email I sent you. I don't expect, I, I don't expect you to have actually looked at it, but <laughs> I, I usually throw this out there to most of my guests because it's not a normal question, but when it's a baseball guest, I always ask every guest, what's the biggest home running you've hit in your career? What's the biggest swing and miss you've taken? And what is small ball? But with a baseball guest, it's like, well, it could be the biggest home run you've hit, or it could be a, a moment in your career. Do, do you have a favorite either home run or just something that you're most proud of with that career? 
Um, home run would probably be the Houston one, and uh, the, when we had the big comeback, and then that kind of put us up by three runs, and that was crazy, man. Because Houston, you know, a lot of the the dugouts are connected to the clubhouses, and you got to run up and either get a new bat or some batting gloves or whatnot. And I remember running up, and and even Dyson will tell the story that he saw the champagne and all the beer getting transported to their locker room. So it was like that crazy year of 14. We come 90 feet away from winning, roll through the whole 15 season, and basically we're just like, all right, we need to get to the World Series or whatnot. And at that moment, it was like, damn, we we might not get to the World Series. We're going to lose. So for homers, I think that was a big one for me. And, and it's always cool to be uh, on the road and, and kind of silence the crowd. That was yeah. That was sweet. I, I was with HUD because we were doing the show at Power and Light, so I wasn't there. Where's, where's, where's Power and Light? I've never heard of that place. No, no, we'll get to that. That's my final question. <laughs> we'll get there in a moment. Uh, if you forgot that, then you, you bought more than just for the whole crowd. You bought for yourself. <laughs> anyway, um, no, the greatest home run I ever saw in Houston was Albert Pujols' is off, off of Brad Lidge, and the place went from you couldn't hear. It was like a rock concert to somebody hitting the mute button, mm -hmm. and, and, and that was that. But anyway, how about a – a swing and a miss, or maybe I'll, I'll put it more this way. Maybe in terms of regret, because, you know, I get asked this question a lot, not necessarily about you, just in general. You think guys wish they hadn't left, and, and, I, and I try to explain to people that, look, if somebody in your profession offered you massive amounts of money, no matter what you have, to change the course of your family's history – then you would do it. Guys in previous generations would have done it too if it was available to them. So I don't, I don't know why anyone would ever have regret for that. What at least I, my interpretation is that no matter what San Diego was or wasn't, no matter what Boston was or wasn't, Chicago or whatever, you're never going to have what you had in Kansas City again. And that's not just a Kansas City thing. I mean, we love it here, of course. Mm -hmm. It's that you're never, ever going to have a group like that again. It's impossible. Even if it's a group that is more talented or better or does equal things, you'll never have that mix. So I don't know if I'm reading that right. And I, I, I can't imagine you have regret in leaving Kansas City, but any regrets or swings and misses for you? Certainly no regrets, man, because like you say, you, you got to do what's best for you and your family. And, you know, there's, there's certainly gaps that – you just can't really, it's hard to look away from. And, you know, I, I felt financially that I had to put my family, I had an opportunity to put my family in a, in a great situation. So I had to do that. And like we talked about, you're going to come on, you're going to come on my podcast when we go over there the in uh, Kansas podcast. City. So I will actually, I'm going to break down that whole scenario on how it all happened. Cool. And I would love to do that because that, that that's a big reason that, and then the way, I'm not going to say I was treated bad in San Diego. A lot of people say that. And listen, if you are a top guy and you're not performing the way that they're paying you, then yeah, there's going to come some heat with that. But I would that the Kansas City leaving to San Diego, the whole free agency process and the media and how what they were saying about me in San Diego is the reason why I'm doing stuff like this, because I feel like players want to explain what happened. Players want to explain the situation. They want to tell the fans. They want to kind of tell their side of the story. And it got crazy, man, to the point where all of us were in there with Dayton teaming up. How can we stay here? How can we make this work? And Dayton's in there with us trying to figure out how to make it work. But at the end of the day, you know, someone owns the team and it's what they want to do. And they have ultimate decision. And I don't I'm not I don't blame them for anything, you know, they wanted to do. And. That's just something that I would love to go into further detail with, and I'll do that with you when you when we yes. go on there in uh, in Kansas City. But yeah, I cannot wait to break that whole thing down because it's a crazy story. The Digging Deep podcast. Let's promote that. By the way, just jump online; you'll find it. Now you got Peter Moylan in the mix too. One of my <laughs> one of my favorites. One of the great personalities. One of those people I was talking about that wasn't a superstar, but but just amazing. And it says the the, the website. By the way. Uh, for moonballmedia.com says great guests great conversation i don't know where i fit into the great guest part but i will come on in a heartbeat <laughs> with you guys that would be amazing what is small ball to you you're not a bunker but what, what are the little things that, that 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 kept you relevant in the game just just finding any possible edge you can have on your opponent, trying to trying to steal 90 feet any way you can i think there's there's plenty out there that you can have an edge over guys whether it's 
uh, tendencies for a pitcher, whether certain teams fundamentally don't do something defensively and you can, you know, steal 90 feet on the bases one way or another. Um, that's kind of what it is. And I think that is what Rusty was, was the absolute best at is finding what those edges are on the base pass. Not only that, he took it a step further and he knew stuff about the pitcher. He knew stuff about the other team. He knew everything. So to me, it's, it's, it's recognizing what that edge is and then, telling the group this is our edge this is where we can beat these guys or we have an advantage and exploiting that and i think in a day and age now where there's a lot of information and there's a lot of individual type stuff i think some of the teams are kind of falling away from finding what that team edge is on how you can get on the other opponent rusty's now grandfather in the last couple of months he said he's already given the little little grandbaby the uh, the base running quiz so. <laughs> is he calling him player the little player little oh, player, player yeah little player <laughs> What about Rusty? Dyson would always say he's he's worse than Brett Favre. He's retired five times, came out of retirement. Is he still doing anything with the team? Yeah, he's, I mean, he'll 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 be in the minor leagues coaching guys till the day he dies. He can't give that up. No, nah, he'll never give up. Coach. But I don't think he'll come back to the big leagues again. Like he he likes that schedule. You know, he's the only guy I've ever met that would rather be in the minor leagues than the big leagues. Yeah, <laughs> Isn't that true? very true. Very and a true. legend, if you know. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll put it that way as, as oh, it's yeah. been done before. All right, I always wrap up with four final questions. Let's start with this one since you just talked about 90 feet. Recollections of the Mad Dash, one of the great plays in Kansas City Royals history in the World Series against the New York Mets, and somehow on a ground ball to third, you're coming home. They're the edge we talked about, you know, stealing 90 feet, finding a way. That was something that Jersh and Rusty were drilling in our heads every single day. Hey, you guys can steal 90 feet from these guys. These guys are banged up. These guys are out of position. They can't do this. They can't do that. And that was something that was just kind of instilled in our brains, man. And I always tell the story the day before they did a pickoff to first and I was on third base. And due to drop the ball at first, and I kind of like flinched like I was going to run home and like turn to look at Jersh to see if he had a reaction to try and kind of scare him a little bit. And he was like, hey, no, if that ball would have got a little mm -hmm. farther, you could make that. So I think all those things went into it. But it's so funny to hear everyone's different perspective on where they were during the play. You know, my dad tells a funny story that he was in the fan section. He kind of stood up out of his seat and was like, what the? are you doing Eric? And then I made it home and he was like, Oh, that a boy. And like went nuts after that. So it's so funny to hear everyone's perspective on it. And that I'm staring at the bobblehead right over your left shoulder there. That was something that definitely uh, made an impact in my career for sure. There it is right there. Ooh, right. Four of five. Or that was the whole set. Oh, that was the series. 2017 yep. Royals bobblehead series. I don't remember what else. I don't, I don't remember what happened yesterday, but that was, that was one. <laughs> I remember the other one was Moose when he made that catch going into the dugout suite. Well, that was another one. Classic moment, right, right, right there at third base. Well, your your bad dash home was in New York. All right, we'll we'll relive that and remember that one forever. By the way, as you mentioned, Mike Jershley, who was the third base coach, Rusty Coons, the first base coach, kind of similar to Rusty. Doesn't have the same good hair, obviously. He keeps resurfacing. Also loves being in minor leagues more than the big leagues. Don't know why. I don't know. He just keeps wanting to retire and go back to Wisconsin, and he keeps on managing. We, we love both of those guys. All right, second question as we round the bases. We finally reached the point. This year's the 10-year reunion of the team that broke the 30-year drought, 29-year drought of going to the playoffs. And then next year, the reunion, lot, most of the same guys will be back. Saw a few of them come into town for some things last year. You know, We saw Vargas, saw Volke. But to, to start getting all these guys back, how cool – I know how cool this is going to be for fans. How cool will it be for all of you? Oh, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so fun. You know, I hadn't I hadn't been back to Kansas City since me getting traded to Boston and then finding out I needed to get on a plane from San Diego to Boston because that's where we opened up. So it was always something I would look forward to, and we were supposed to go in San Diego during the 2020 season. Right. And then obviously the schedule changed and all that type of stuff, but – now that I get to just go and hang out and I don't have to worry about being at a game the next day, you know, I can go to that power and light place you mentioned. I feel like that's a, a good spot to go, but I get to go and interact with them off the field. You know, it was always mostly just at the field, at the stadium yeah. and BP and the BP passes, whoever had that. But now I get to, you know, go to the restaurants and hang out and 
be with all those guys. So I know we're going to have so much fun with it. And, um, you know, the 14 ones this year, the 15 ones coming up. So it's going to be a fun couple of years. All right. Third question as we round the bases. Well, I was going to make the McFadden's thing last, but I'll just, I always tell people just roll with the conversation. So let, let's talk about that night. What are your recollections? I know you get all the credit for it, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure that that Dyson and maybe Gia Vitella were involved. I mean, I don't know who who opened their wallets the biggest, but you're the guy that got the credit for it. Uh, you know, there, there's a pretty simple rule in life when you're a star in town and you open up your wallet to buy everyone at the bar a drink, you're mm-hmm. going to be a star forever. I don't <laughs> think that was the intent. Everybody was really happy. What do you remember about that that night? So the funny story, because I got on Bobby Witt Jr. for not getting a Super Bowl suite about because he signed his deal a week before the Super Bowl. So I'm like, come on, man, we got to look out for the guys. But so it was me. Okay. So it was me, Dyson and Giovatella. We were pretty much the only young single guys on the team. We didn't have any, you know, wives, kids, nothing like that. We all lived together. So we're leaving the stadium. We're all jacked up after winning the series and all that type of stuff. And Dyson's driving. I'm in the front seat and Gio's in the back seat. And Dyson and Gio are like, man, they're like, Haas, you should tweet out that we're going to go to the Power and Light District. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And this is right when Twitter just gotten started and all that, which is now X. So I get on there and I'm like, hey, you know, you guys showed us love all year. We're going to return the favor. Like, let's all go to McFadden's and blah, blah, blah. We'll hang out. And, you know, we expected a good amount of people to be there. We definitely didn't expect what, what was what happened. So at that point in time, we were all I actually mistaken. We were all moved out of our apartment. We're living in the hotel. So we're staying in the hotel at uh, downtown at the Marriott. And we get down to the lobby and we get down to the lobby and there's like three cops there. And we're about to get in a taxi. I don't even know if Uber was a thing or like it was very it wasn't everywhere. So we're about to find a ride to Power and Light. And the cops come up to us and they're like, man, I don't know if you realize what you just did. And I'm like, what, what did I do? I don't know. So they, we get in the back of the cop cars and we go the other side, like towards the Sprint Center. And it looks like, I mean, it looks like the World Series parade. There's just people everywhere. And we walk into McFadden's, people are cheering. There's cameras there from the news and all that type of stuff. And we're like, man, we had no idea what we just got ourselves into. And then it became every series was like, hey, we're going back to McFadden's. <laughs> and that was our spot. And we were always there. And it was, it was an awesome time. And what's what's cool about that was uh, Kelsey and Charkandrick West. They were the two guys on the football Mm -hmm. team that they would always hang out with me and Dyson. We would always find them. We'd always hang out. We'd always go out, whatever it was. And those guys were tagging along with us. And to see what they've turned that football team into now is is just unbelievable. And Kansas City's title town now as of 2014. A little better than your Giants, I'll tell, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I mean, you guys just lost oh, Saquon. Yeah. You just lost Saquon to the Eagles. Come on, how, how much worse does it get? Yeah, don't give. I'm fully aware of that. I move, know. I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I noticed I'm taking cheap shots at the end of the the podcast. You know, if this were if this were today, maybe you still are. You, you can go hang with Travis and Taylor. You, I mean, that's what everybody wants. Hey, you know what I will say is, me and uh, me and Travis, we have this little like text exchange, and he would, you know, he texted me during the World Series saying good luck. And then during Super Bowls, I would always text them and just be like, hey, man, unbelievable what you guys are doing. Good luck again, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, to this day, it's been like 10 years. We still have that kind of that thread going. And he hasn't changed at all, man. And I know he's gotten a lot more famous and there's a lot more that have stuff that has come his way. But every time I see him, man, he's he's the same guy. I love it. All right. Last thing, my, my walk off. I, I was just going to list off some players to have you do either a word or a sentence on them. But I'm going to start somewhere that that would maybe not be expected. Because I think that if you're on the other side of Manny Machado, you might not like him. He, he, you know, he's got a lot of swag and he's cock. Every time I looked up with San Diego, it was the two of you like trying to outduel each other in a fashion show or something like that with your <laughs> walk-ins and walkouts. Who's going to be the best looking guy? I always thought that you had this ability to connect, I said it before, with everybody. And that could be a guy that nobody knew about or a guy that might have a reputation of being a little bit on the cocky side or a guy that was a, you know, labeled at least a prima donna. I don't know Manny Machado. I've talked to him once or twice. I'm pretty willing to bet that if he was on my team, I would connect with him and everything would be fine. But I don't know him like that. I know him as kind of a showy superstar. You, I'm sure, saw another side. 
Oh man, he is, and I think I think the narrative is is has gone away. But yeah. he for a while was the most under misunderstood baseball player, in my opinion, active baseball player of all time. Like he he literally is he's Lorenzo Kane. He's moves all slow in the clubhouse. He's like, man, my feet hurt. I need to get it in the training table. <laughs> And he's on that training table for four hours a day, but he is going to play that night. And you know you're going to get everything out of him. But I think even Manny will – and what's so cool about Manny is I got to see Manny in that leadership role. So he'll bring up times where, hey, man, you know, there was a year there, a couple of years where I wasn't doing things the right way looking back on it now. And, and I've learned from that stuff. So to have him around a guy like Tatis and some of these young studs that they got over there in San Diego is priceless, man, because – He's gotten to the point now where he had that perspective. People thought, oh, man, this guy's doing this stuff and that's not right, blah, blah, blah. He's then went on and kind of like we said, how you earn trust of people over that long haul, that long course of mm -hmm. whatever time you spend with them. He's never tried to like campaign his way into people liking him again. He's mm -hmm. just like, listen, man, like I messed up. That was me. I'm not that guy anymore. And slowly over time people in san diego are like dude like i don't know what these people are talking about and what this narrative is about you because he's one of the most chilled relaxed just good dudes that you'll ever see and that leadership stuff man he goes above and beyond and even his wife his wife will have you know parties with the wives they'll go to dinners they're setting up dinners on the road like he's the man dude you would you would definitely love having him on your side i'll talk to him this year when when we face the Padres uh, they come here how about let, let's go quick on all of these well you I mentioned Kane he's been on the podcast I get guys when they retire it seems like a better thing to to do what else you got on Kane oh man Kane is he best, is right? just he's the best he's always tired and he's always his feet always hurt uh we have our group chat we have our group chat going and the day I retired I'm like Kane I'm chilling with you, buddy. He's like, that's right, man. We chilling. We living good. <laughs> and How you know about, what the funny story about Kane was? Listen to this real quick. So I was 18. I just got drafted with the Royals. It's And we're in the offseason. And there was an agent that went to my school. And he's, you know, he was a couple years older. He was driving up to Tallahassee to Florida State to hang out for a couple days, watch a football game and all that type of stuff. So he's like, you want to tag along with me? So me and my buddies tag along with him. So we get to I-10. We're about to, in Jacksonville, about to go straight west to uh, or east, whatever, east to Tallahassee. And we stop in Madison County and we stop at Lorenzo Kane's house. And Kane is sitting there. And, and I'm sure Kane has spoke about this, but it's, it's a trailer park and he's not living lavishly at all. Kane is sitting there with his niece and his mother and he's looking at his agent and his agent's like, listen, um, uh, Grinky or what was it? No, CC Sabathia just got traded from Cleveland to Milwaukee. There was four players in the trade, and there's one more to be named later. It's either you or Michael Brantley. So there's a possibility that you're going to get traded uh, to Cleveland within the next couple of weeks. And Kane's just like, man, I don't care if I get traded or what happens. I just need some money, man. Look where I'm at. Look where I'm living. I need some money. And it was crazy because when Kane got traded over to us, right when I saw him at FanFest, I was like, dude, do you remember me? And he's like, yeah, you were the guy that came to my house. So me and Kane go way back to when I was like 17 years old, and I got to kind of witness that firsthand. It was crazy. I never heard that story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I can't. I'm sure. I feel like we've told that story, but I don't know if we ever told I you I never that. heard it, and that makes me, again, reminds me I got more work to do because, you know, when you're curious <laughs> and you ask, you poke around, you know, one day I'm talking to Haas, and suddenly I find out as a kid he used to watch Kendris Morales playing Cuban baseball with his grandfather on a Sunday because you'd watch Cuban baseball. So you never know. Like, there's so many cool stories. They just You guys don't publish them. So you, yeah. you got to dig a little bit on this stuff. Um, all right, a couple more guys to to go through. The Duff man, Danny Duffy. Oh, man. One of the most loyal dudes you'll ever meet in your life. There is there is no doubt in my mind that Duffy, if my son needed something, if my family needed something, God willing, something Amen. happened to me, that Duffy would be the first one there for them. I mean, I could be getting jumped by 10 bodybuilding looking dudes and Duffy's going to go head first into that pile knowing he's got no chance, but he's just going to be there for me. So, um, and one of them, I can see it over there too. The Duffy in the bear suit was one of the <laughs> first things that comes to my mind when I think of Duff, man. I don't know if I could tell this or not. 
Ah, screw it. I, I know that the, <laughs> the, the night of the bear suit, I walked out and I see Chris Young walking in with his family. He'd been up taking pictures on the field. And I'm like, he's like, I'm like, congrats, CY. He's like, thanks, you too, Joel. And I'm like, I just interviewed Danny Duffy in a bear suit. He goes, did he have clothes on this time? I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> hey, and that's his boss now. CY is over in Texas with Duffy. Well, that's why that? it, it, it all worked out. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that. It's not that bad. Uh, the last two, you touched on it, but I, I don't know that you were – well, the last two, I think, were the two guys you were closest with by my perception. I, I don't know that you were as close with anyone as you were Gerard Dyson. What what was so special about that? You you two were like Batman and Robin to me. Yeah, so so obviously, you know, Moose and Dyson are my two best friends in this whole world. And they're they're guys that I've looked up to my whole career because you know, they taught me what it was like to be a man. You know, I was um I wasn't rich growing up. I wasn't poor, but I was certainly spoiled. You know what I mean? My parents would do anything for me. And um, just seeing, you know, Moose obviously was married with Steph and off the field, they had kids. So they were doing different stuff when they had kids and all that type of stuff, which is understandably so. And Dyson and I would always, you know, live together. We were kind of the only guys on the team that, you know, really didn't have a significant other with us there at all times. So seeing what Dyson was going through off the field with his family and how he would handle and how he would respond to the adversity he was going through. It reminded me so much of my mom because my mom was going through so much adversity with her family, something happening, somebody getting in trouble, someone needing something from them. And I just always saw how whenever they hung up the phone, he had the ability around me to just kind of, you know, act like nothing was going on. Mm -hmm. and, and like the way he handled all that stress, and all that adversity, like I just learned from it. I was like, man, like I went over four the other day and I'm thinking I'm going through some tough times, like what this guy's going through and how he's, you know, carrying that with him and how he's acting and seeing how motivated he was to make it to the big leagues for his son, to, to ha have his son have a better lifestyle and be able to do things that he couldn't do as a kid gave me a whole different perspective on things and really just like opened my eyes on what it was like to be a grown up. And um, I have a funny, a funny Dyson story that you'll love. Um, so we're at a bar and, you know, Dyson, for me, like I was never confident enough to go up to a girl and be like, hey, I'm Eric. How you doing? Nice to meet you, whatever. So I'm sitting over there and there's, you know, this is when I was like 21, 22, whatever it was. I don't even think this is the big leagues yet. And I'm looking at this girl and Dyson's like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, man, that girl over there, she's looking good. And he's like. You keep thinking you prettier than these girls. They ain't never going to talk to you. Get up there and say something to her. And I'm like, all right. So he would literally, man, he just taught me all these little things. And then obviously with the serious life lesson stuff, me and him bonded and connected on another level. And, you know, I went through some of my toughest times in life with Dice. And he was there for me every step of the way. And same with Moose. You know, Moose, I was there for some of his toughest times. And he was there with some of mine. And Moose was the guy that really, really taught me how to lead and how to, you know, take care of the younger guys. I think the difference between Moose and I was I had that ability to give a political answer and sound right. Mm -hmm. Moose was just all truth, all Unfiltered. real, all that type of stuff. Unfiltered, exactly. Um, but it was cool, man, because I've, I've said it before, but, you know, watching Steph and Moose, watching what they had, um, it made me want to have that one day. It really did. So, I would look up to them and and those are my two guys for sure that if you ask me who had the two biggest impacts from a player standpoint it's moose and dyson without a question that's why i saved them for last that was batman and robin part one and part two i mean there's just you could see it every day uh with, with the way that you know you and moose were always forever linked you know the, the top mm -hmm. picks in, in in 07 and 08 and the corners and all that but I, the, the dyson relationship from what i saw was just just as as strong and um, so uh, unbelievable stuff. I knew we would go really long and I, I hope people enjoy it. There's more of this to come. So uh, real quick, tell me about uh, th this Digging Deep podcast. People can find it everywhere and it's it's really good stuff. It is. It's fun. So we it's on YouTube, Spotify, all that type of stuff. I don't even know the ins and outs of all that, but we we've got some very very cool guests coming on man we just did a run in, in spring training 
Uh, we got Salvi on there, Moose on there. We got Bobby Witt on there, which was really cool. Um, and then we got some guys outside the Kansas City organization that I think a lot of people in baseball will really enjoy. And, you know, like we said, I, I'm not trying to come into this media space to break news or any of that type of stuff. I'm just trying to, you know, really enlighten the fans on how how hard this game is, how impressive some of these players are, and then share stories if these guys want to share stories or even be that voice of the two scenarios I told you when I wanted as a player to explain my side of it. You know, maybe there's something that I can explain that can give the fan a different perspective of all that type of stuff. So it's something that's really fun. I'm looking forward to it. And I know, you know, we've been working with the Royals on trying to do more stuff in Kansas City. So hopefully you'll be seeing us out there a lot more. And, um, you know, like I said, you're coming on. So uh, whether you like it or not, but we're going to. No, I like it. We're going to die. We're going to dig deep into that story, buddy. It's going to be a good one. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the other side. I might fly out Uncle Joey to have you on there with him, too. Maybe oh, he'll bring out yeah. some comfort. <laughs> Legendary. He's the yeah, only one in the game that has a championship ring. He is. Look at Jack. Yeah, the little man behind you. Hey. How'd you get here, buddy? Look. That's how long we went. Ooh. Can you say hi, Joel? Can you say hi to Joel? Hi. Hi, Look Joel. That. Say hi. He's ready to play some basketball, man. We got the Hosmer family here now. Yeah. The babysitter's not babysitting. Uh-oh. <laughs> There, there's Can Mama. Hi, bye? Casey. You say bye bye, Joel. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that's it. We got to wrap the ball. Yeah. Up <laughs> wrap it up what, there, buddy. What better way to wrap soon. things up. Yeah. <laughs> bye, Joel. See you soon. Bye, Casey. Bye. How about that, huh? That that was better than the first hour in 16 minutes. Oh man, it's priceless right there, buddy. Nothing better. Nothing. Haas, love you, brother. It's it's been. I told you this in the text. It's been an honor to 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 be a small part of it, and and something that that I will treasure forever. And I, I can't wait to see what's next for you. Not just with with the podcast, which will be great. Whatever else you're gonna do with that company, uh, with Moonball, and and being a husband and a father, and and everything else that's to come. It's uh, I'm so excited for you, and congrats on such an amazing career. Appreciate it, Joel. I love you too, man. And I know we'll be seeing each other a lot more in the future and can't wait, man. Even the reunions, all that type of stuff coming up. It's going to be a blast. Man, it's a love fest. Thanks for coming on, Haas. <laughs> all right, Joel. Thanks, buddy.